uh, being a rookie ambassador in, in, in Washington, D.C. I've been going for about eight months, uh, and this is our, our first uh, uh, event in, in the capital. And I'm so glad to see all of you here, and I'm so glad uh, that we can have this uh, very important event with the theme of uh, Islam and democracy evolving to compatibility in the uh, uh, 21st century. Uh, we have a very good uh, list of uh, speakers, but uh, even better, we have a very good list of our congressional friends uh, who will uh, share with us a few remarks before uh, Indonesia, Mali, and Iraq speak up about this very important issue. Unfortunately, uh, Bosnia, uh, which we have uh, to come uh, to represent European Muslim uh, democracy, uh, could not uh, be here. Uh, so at the last minute, they, they offered their apologies, but uh, I'll show you we will have a very good discussion. Uh, we will have an opening by, by uh, Representative uh, Jim, Jim McDermott, uh, followed by uh, uh, Congressman David Fryer, and then uh, Congressman, uh, followed by uh, Congressman uh, David Cross. Uh, and uh, possibly uh, Congressman Andre Carson will drop by to say a few words. But uh, for now, let me invite uh, Congressman Jim McDermott uh, to say a few words. Thank you very much. The ambassador is too humble. He was once a speechwriter for the president, so he's not a rookie. I don't care what you, you come in here and tell us you're a rookie, you're not. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I appreciate that introduction. On behalf of the Indian, uh, Indonesian caucus, um, Dan Burke and I uh, both uh, have met with the ambassador and are really uh, interested in talking a little bit about Islam and democracy. And I want to thank the ambassador for coming up and raising the issue. Um, it's nice to have it brought into the Congress uh, by people from the outside, from places where they actually know what they're talking about. And when he came to the office earlier, we talked about the rise of Islamophobia in this country, and uh, the need to try and dispel the notion that somehow Islam and democracy are incompatible. Uh, if, if we can do nothing more than that, we will have succeeded, succeeded in this effort. Now, the countries that are represented today here, uh, as well as countries like Turkey, have great stories to tell on democratic governments in Muslim-majority countries. Too often, the extremists dominate the news. Uh, as we all know, especially in this business, uh, the press is not exactly the place to find out what's really going on uh, in an awful lot of situations, and we rarely hear of the steady progress that these countries like Iraq are making in terms of democratic governance. That's true in Indonesia, it's true in Tunisia, it's true in a lot of places where there is a beginning of a democracy. And I think that it's important, I, I keep telling people that democracy is an evolutionary form of government. It never is finished. We, if you look at the United States, where we were in 1789, and then look at where we are in 2011. Uh, we went 100 years with slaves and 135 years we didn't let women vote. And there's all kinds of things about our democracy that evolutionarily we changed. And there are nearly 2 billion people of the Muslim faith. 60% uh, of them live in Asia. And today's panel represents a segment of that diverse population. Muslims around the world have had a yearning for freedom and the basic rights, just like the rest of us. And they see from the uprisings in the Middle East recently that it really are, these are universal aspirations. And I think we have a wonderful opportunity today to hear about both Indonesia and Mali and Bosnia and Herzegovina and Iraq and the development of democracy in those areas. So I am very pleased that the ambassador took it upon himself to come up and chase down a couple of congressmen and say, hey, I got an idea. What do you think of it? And it was a good idea. And here we are. So thank you. 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 Uh, let me say what a, uh, a great privilege and honor it is for me to be here with uh, this now veteran ambassador. Uh, eight months clearly makes you a veteran. And uh, as Jim McDermott correctly said, uh, Dino is highly respected because of his work, not just as ambassador, but his work before that. To you too, Mr. Ambassador, let me say what a privilege and honor it is to me to be uh, with you.
with you. I was privileged to lead the first congressional delegation ever to Timbuktu uh, in the uh, early part of the last uh, decade. That actually is a place, and it's in Mali, and uh, it's a privilege to do that. In fact, in, in Timbuktu, where I saw the oldest clay mosque in the world, and I remember very vividly being there, and um, Obviously, uh, Iraq is uh, an extraordinarily challenging spot for us, and I uh, want to say that I'm privileged to be here with my colleague, David Price, uh, who is uh, co-chairman of the House Democracy Partnership, which is a, an organization that has worked directly with the parliaments in new and re-emerging democracies around the world, and our goal has been the development of democratic institutions. And I believe that while people in this country and some around the world uh, refer to a conflict, Mr. Ambassador, between faith and democracy. I actually see it there being an interdependence, an interdependence between faith and democracy. And I'll never forget, uh, as I've said to you, Dino, the first meeting that uh, Mr. Price and I had with President Ono when the House Democracy Partnership was in Jakarta, Indonesia, largest Muslim population in the world, the largest, fourth largest country in the world, you know, what, 1,200 languages, 18,000 islands, I mean, just an incredible place. And um, as I sat down with President Yabayono, the first thing that he said about Indonesia is that it is the convergence of three things. It is the convergence of modernity, Islam, and democracy. And I argue that um, as David Price and I, and Jim McDermott has been a, an active supporter of, of the work of our House Democracy Partnership, as we have looked at new and re-emerging democracies around the world, there is no country that has taken to democracy like Indonesia. I use the term, Indonesia has taken to democracy like a duck to water. The democracy is 12 years old. And yet we have seen the great success of Islam, modernity, and democracy, as President Yevayano has said. And uh, similarly, we have seen tremendous steps made, in large part through the Millennium Challenge uh, grants and others in Mali that have, have, have made tremendous strides. And I was, I was in, uh, David and I were in Bamako. In fact, we were even there longer than we had wanted to be. Uh, we got stuck in Bamako, as you may remember, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, but we had a, we had a, yeah, we had some aircraft difficulty. We were there, but we were very, very struck with the kind of commitment that exists in uh, in in Mali for the continued development and expansion of democracy. Now, the real challenge that we have right now is as we look at the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening. And one of the things that our House Democracy Partnership is doing is encouraging uh, countries like Indonesia to play a role, as they already have, in the development of these institutions in Egypt. And uh, I think that, that we have a tremendous, and I congratulate you again, Dino, for putting this, this effort together. As we can break down the, and bring an end to the myths that exist of this, this inability for democracy and faith and Islam to thrive, uh, I think that we are in a position uh, right now where there is a, a, a great, great chance for us to see it become uh, even more successful as we look at the role that these wonderful countries have been able to play uh, in providing the example that is necessary for the success of the Arab Spring. So let me uh, thank you all uh, very much and say it's a privilege to be here, and I'm going to have to leave in just a few minutes, but uh, it's a, a great uh, honor for, uh, for me to be able to be part of this, and I congratulate you again, Mr. Ambassador, for putting it together. Thank you very much, David. And very positive comments. Uh, and that's uh, remarks by Congressman David Trump. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and thanks to uh, all of you who are uh, going to be part of this discussion today, and, and, and those of you who have shown uh, such interest in this, this is a, a great turnout, and it's a very, very important topic, as my colleagues have said. So I'm, uh, I won't speak long, but I'm 
happy to help launch this, uh, this discussion. Um, the Indonesian Embassy, the Ambassador, have obviously taken the lead in putting this together. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is just yet another example of, of, of the leadership of this Ambassador and this country in providing an example of, uh, of, of the democratic development and also in reaching out to uh, colleagues and uh, interlocutors here in, uh, in Washington to uh, foster discussions of this sort. This isn't the first one, and, uh, and yet it's the first one here on Capitol Hill that's focused on just this topic, so it's, uh, it's very promising. Uh, my colleague, uh, David Dreyer, the chairman of our Council of Democracy Partnership, has um, already talked about our uh, work with Indonesia, one of the most uh, enjoyable and, and I think productive uh, relationships that we've had in fostering institutional development in, uh, in, in partner countries, mutually beneficial uh, relationship that goes far beyond the usual parliamentary exchanges, but instead focuses on common work that we can do to strengthen the functioning of our parliaments, understanding that democracy is not just about elections, it's also about what happens between elections what happens between elections depends on responsive, effective, legitimate, uh, representative institutions. So um, we have had in our, uh, in our short uh, six-year history, we, we, we have had partnerships with uh, 13 countries, uh, five of which are majority Muslim uh, countries. Uh, not just Indonesia, the world's largest majority Muslim country, but also Kosovo, Lebanon, Afghanistan and Pakistan. We also have uh, been able to visit and work in various ways with other other countries, uh, many represented here today, like Mali. Uh, we had a, had a terrific visit to Mali last year. Uh, we visited Bosnia. We have worked with Iraq and hope to work with Iraq in, in the future. Um, now, these countries uh, all have challenges in, in developing and maintaining legitimate, effective institutions. Don't we all have those challenges, uh, by the way? Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, endemic to, to life in a, in, in a democracy. But every one of these countries has members and leaders in their parliaments who are uh, committed to uh, making those institutions effective and who uh, are committed to uh, working with us and other colleagues uh, around the world in, in uh, sharing best practices, and in uh, supporting each other, uh, being colleagues across national lines in a way that uh, is, I think, extremely important in, uh, in the development of all of our countries and the development of the prospect for a, for a peaceful world. Um, we do, as, as Mr. Dreyer has emphasized, we do also need all to reach out to newly emerging democracies, particularly as we see the progress of the Arab Spring and understand that uh, in very short order here, we will have new parliaments elected in Tunisia, in Egypt, in other places. Uh, we can all think of countries that we hope and pray uh, one day will we'll be in a position to be uh, independent, effective uh, democracies. So this work isn't going to stop. I think it's, uh, it's, it's only going to become uh, more important. But uh, the kind of basic understanding that I think we can gain from discussions like we're having today are very, very important to our uh, our work and our understanding as we go forward. So, so thank you for organizing this and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman, for, for those very useful and, and positive comments. Uh, with your permission, uh, Voice America has uh, asked me that, that the first presentation be done on, on the podium because for technical reasons the microphone is there. And I hope they're going to send this also to. Uh, Voice America agents at Russia. So I noticed Voice of America didn't want our president. <laughs> so that's good judgment on that. Thank you. Secret society, but that's all. <laughs> I don't want to know about it. <laughs> Good. Look, it's, it's great honor. Top uh, for, secret. Top secret. It's great honor for. Well, just for 30 seconds, we broke a world record uh, last Saturday. Uh, what was it? Uh, a world record for the largest number of people playing uh, Indonesian musical instrument, uh, Angklung, oh, at, at the national monument. 5,000 people showed up. It usually takes about 20.
invitation to come here today got even stronger when I read an article by an Islamist uh, a few days ago that said that Islam should be against democracy. Right? Now, I wish I had known his address because I would like to call him and ask what century he's living in. Uh, but let me tell you the central tenet of my talk. Islam and democracy are compatible. Islam cannot and can no longer be used as an excuse to reject democracy. Uh, it's true that Islam in the past has often been associated with autocracy, but so is Christianity, right? So the question is not where Islam has been or where Christianity has been, but where it is going in the future. And Indonesia is a rich example and a very interesting and relevant case study to this big question about where Islam and democracy will find compatibility in the 21st century. They may not have found compatibility in the previous century, but I think they are increasingly going to find compatibility in the century that we're living in now. Indonesia is relevant because we went straight from authoritarianism to democracy in 1999, when we had our first elections. And we found out that at that time, Indonesians, including Indonesian Muslims, had no willingness to trade one form of authoritarianism with another form of authoritarianism. They wanted democracy. Right? So we've now about 13 years into our democracy since the first election in 1999. We have found many things, and this is what I want to share with you, what we have found. First, we found that the mainstream of Islam gets along very well with the mainstream of democracy. Now, I say mainstream because in a country as large as 240 million people, there are bound to be exceptions and anomalies. But the mainstream of Islam, of Muslims in Indonesia, in the mainstream of democracy, get along very well. There's a recent survey that found 85% of Indonesians believe that Islam and democracy are naturally compatible. It's a very revealing goal. Secondly, we found that the more Indonesians are becoming more religious, but we're also becoming more democratic. Uh, I don't have the stats about how many Indonesians are becoming more religious, but I do have anecdotal evidence. My mother, right, and my cousins. My mother is praying five times a day. She calls me every day and asks me, have you prayed today? You know, <laughs> I don't like to tell her the, the real truth because uh, it's just, uh, I'm not that good a Muslim as yet. But, uh, and then my, my mom wears veils now, and so do so my cousins. But that does not inform her political perspective. Right? Uh, she votes, she loves to vote, she does not vote for an Islamic party, she votes for a party that caters to her views. Right? So this is happening across Indonesia. Indonesians are becoming more religious, they go to the mosques, they go to churches, uh, for Christians, and so on and so on. But they're also embracing democracy much more strongly. Third, we have found that Indonesian Muslims love democracy. Right? What do I mean by, uh, you know, uh, they, vote in great numbers. 85% uh, of Indonesians are Muslims. And the voting turnout in Indonesia is very, very high. The voting turnout is about uh, 104 million at the last uh, election in 2009. In 2004, it's about 113 million uh, out of 148 registered voters. They love to vote. They love the freedom of the press. They love like to criticize the government. They love uh, to, to elect their own officials. They like to bring them down when they, they don't do what uh, you know, they're supposed to do. And in fact, uh, one article said that Indonesia, among the Muslim world, is an electoral overachiever. Right? And that says a lot about the quality of our Muslims in Indonesia. Fourth, and this is very interesting, in Indonesia, the strongest supporter of democracy are the Islamist parties. And you figure that, right? And you know, why, right? And then I figure out, it's not so difficult. Under Suharto, sorry, under the authoritarian past, Islamic parties were limited. They could not come to the surface. There were a lot of restrictions on them, right? But once they, once Indonesia became a democracy, we had an open, competitive political system. Islamic parties came uh, to the fore. Uh, there were proliferation of Islamic parties. So Islamic parties have an interest in the growth of our democracy because it is under democracy that they can come out in the open and become free. Right? Uh, so uh, it, I think it's one of the most interesting part about how Islam and democracy connects is the fact that Islamic political parties are strong 
some supporters of our democracy. And uh, we have found out also that Islamic leaders are becoming the most ardent supporter of our democracy. Uh, you know, in, in, in Indonesia has a lot of religious and intellectual Islamic leaders, the icons of Islam in Indonesia. The pre prevalent majority of them are democratic at heart and politically and socially. And in fact, when our democracy is under threat, they are always the first ones to speak out in support of democracy. And that helps us a lot. You know, that helps us to, to, uh, to maintain this balance and a healthy connection between Islam and democracy in our uh, body politics. Six, we have found out that Indonesian Muslims do not necessarily vote for Islamic parties. This is also interesting. The total votes cast for Islamic parties in Indonesia is about 15%. And in some areas, uh, traditional Islamic parties are declining in terms of their vote. Like East Java, there was a PKB. Uh, they began in 1999 with 36% of the vote uh, because that, that stronghold uh, now is down to, I think, in, uh, 11 percent if I'm not mistaken. But uh, the interesting thing about Islamic voters is they're saying, like my mother, saying, look, if you want my vote, don't go around waving the Islamic flag. Don't go around telling us that you're Muslim and because of that we have to vote for you. Right? Politics have been modernized. Islamic voters are saying to their politician, if you want our vote, come up with a good platform. Don't wave the religious card. Don't use that as an excuse for us how to manipulate us to vote for you. And this is happening in a lot of places. And this has become a learning lesson for many of the politicians because they say, look, after three elections, we realize if we want to get more votes, you got to do something more than just proving your Islamic credentials. And that has the effect of maturing and modernizing Indonesian politics. We have had in the past uh, popular clerics who ran for president, but they didn't do so well because all they did was try to pass the Islamic part. They didn't do more and beyond that. Seventh, we found out in, that in Indonesia, Indonesian Muslims do not wish for an Islamic state. And in fact, the majority of them, this is according to polls, uh, do not uh, support the implementation of Sharia in Indonesia. Eighth, we found out that Indonesians, and including Indonesian Muslims, are becoming more pluralistic and tolerant. Right? Uh, again, I don't know how to explain this, but the more we embrace democracy, the more there is interfaith harmony, the more we respect religious freedom, and the more when there's cases of one religion having one religious group imposing their wills on another whenever there's an incident, the majority speaks up, right? And the nice thing is that this is not just Muslims towards Christians or Hindus, but also this is Hindus and Christians and Buddhists towards Muslims. So it's a two-way street, uh, this, this growing pluralism, tolerance, uh, and respect for religious uh, freedom. Tonight, we find out that as Islam and democracy embrace one another, we also have to deal with radicalism, extremism, and terrorism. This is inevitable, and this is a global thing. This is not just an Indonesia thing. It's a very small minority group that embraces radicalism, extremism, and terrorism, but they are there in Indonesia. We, there was a time for the, in the first few years we were grappling on how to deal with it, but we found out a formula. The formula is no matter how we deal, no matter what measures we take against terrorism, it should never be at the expense of our democracy and human rights. Right? It took about two, three years for us to figure that, that out. So now uh, we have embraced this principle very firmly and strongly that how we deal with extremism and terrorism, uh, no matter how painful it is, uh, we must not trample on human rights and we must not reverse the gains made by our uh, democracy. And tenth, uh, we found out uh, that Indonesia can be the center of gravity for the Islamic world. Now what do I mean by this? For every Muslim, the center of the gravity spiritually is Mecca. You know, we all pray towards Mecca. You know, every day, five times a day, we all pray towards Mecca. Nothing can ever replace that. Because that's in the Quran, that's what our prophet says. But politically, and socially, and economically, no. Right? The center of gravity Islamic world is not Mecca, it's not Saudi Arabia. In fact, we are saying to ourselves, no. You know, the Middle Eastern and 
us. They have as much to learn from us. You know, we are success story. Indonesians can uh, seize globalization. We can uh, advance uh, democracy. We can have high economic growth. We can have social justice and all these things. Perhaps we can also be a gravity for the Islamic world. So what you see in Indonesia, and also in Malaysia and other countries, is a growing confidence that there should not be a center of gravity for the Islamic world. In fact, uh, we also can be that, uh, that center, uh, the mover and shaker uh, uh, in the uh, Islamic world. Let me end with this one point. Uh, first is the challenge for Islam. We have found out also in Indonesia, there's been some modernization of the way we look at Islam and how Islam fits in the global world. And in our view, the key to progress and peace for Islam in the international system is our ability to look forward, not to look backward. The key is not to bring back Islam to the 13th century uh, as Osama bin Laden wants to do and some of his uh, what call believers want to want. The key is how to bring Islam up to speed in the 21st century. Muslims cannot be afraid of globalization. Muslims lost uh, the train when it came to the Industrial Revolution with the Europeans were climbing up with the Renaissance, with the information revolution in the West, and all these revolutions, uh, a lot of Muslim societies felt they were left behind. And some through their own fault, right, because they did not see the time, the sign of the times. But the key to the 21st century uh, progressive Islam is being able to redefine Islam and to put uh, the teaching of Islam uh, in a contextual way rather than a textual way. Indonesians are very good at it. You know, when we read the Quran, we want to understand it in the context of the time, rather than strictly interpreting the text of the Quran itself. Right? So the ability of Muslims to seize globalization, to be forward-looking, uh, to, to believe that they can uh, beat globalization, not beat, but uh, you know, take advantage of it, and to integrate uh, with the West and engage the West and the rest of the world is very important to the health, the political, social, and economic health of Muslims in the 21st century and in turn of the world. Now, uh, what does that mean for the West? The West also has a challenge. Uh, I think, uh, having been here, uh, I'm so glad to see that America, if, you know, I was here in 1979 as a student. If you ask me, as a foreigner, what is the most important transformation of America, my answer would be the fact that America has become the most multicultural country in the world, right? In 1970s, when I lived there, it did not feel I'll be honest with you, you were demographically multicultural, but not necessarily politically or economically or socially multicultural. But you have become that in 30 years' time, and uh, you know, I admire you so much for that. Right? And in that sense, you have a lot of political and social capital to lead the world on the question of multiculturalism and, 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 and interfaith uh, harmony. One of the things that impressed me the most about America since I came here was uh, this new experiment of pioneers of religious leaders. I went to ISNA, the, uh, the Islamic Society of North America. And uh, they did an experiment where they held a convention that, and they invited Jewish leaders from the Jewish uh, organizations to come and speak. And at first, it didn't work out very well. Both the Islamic organizations and the Jewish uh, leader did not feel comfortable. But once they did it, they felt they were onto something. And then the Jewish organizations, when they held their national congress, invited the Islamic leader. And the Islamic leader came and received with wild applause, you know. And they said, hey, we're onto something. Okay? And this pioneering thing, this pioneering mindset to think about the path you have to break into the future, rather than just relying on the previous patterns of conflict and disunity, is what America is special. You take the risk, not just our of business entrepreneurs, but as a political entrepreneurs, as social entrepreneurs. And I hope this kind of pioneer, pioneering work on interfaith uh, and religious freedom uh, 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 collaboration is something that you will continue to inflame and show the world, and hopefully something that you can work with the government of Indonesia, the government of Iraq, the government of Mali, uh, so that we can uh, produce a 21st century where we avoid a clash of civilizations 